guys, do you like my shirt? It's very fitting because guess what I have? Black coffee. Remember back in January when I told you I was going to make a video about my favorite books of 2017? One eternity later. My reading year in 2017 was kind of not that great. I read only 56 books, which, you know, for many people that's an astronomical number. For me, I usually read so much more. And I ended up reading a lot of sort of middle of the road books and not that many good books. However, the books I'm going to tell you about are really, really excellent. I have like 10 books, all really good. This is in no particular order except for top five. So I'm going to start with The Inner Life of Animals by Peter Wohleben. He is a German forester and this book was originally published in German. I have the Polish translation. It's actually interesting. I was It was published um, in an English translation. However, it's not that very popular. It's interesting because um, all three of his books, this one and also this one, The Hidden Life of Trees, and there's one more about symbiosis, they are extremely popular in Poland. And I guess, you know, it's natural, or at least it seems to me that um, here, in, generally, in Europe, we have a lot more sort of market exchange in terms of books, like translation is a big part of the book industry, whereas in the English-speaking countries, translation is only a small percentage. So whenever something is published in Germany, it is very quickly translated into Polish, whereas you usually wait for an English translation longer. But somehow it, they are very popular here. Inner Life of Animals is a collection of observations interspersed with some scientific research by this forester who has been a forester basically all of his life and who takes care of a lot of animals and observes them on a daily basis. And his observations about how animals experience emotions. So for instance, we have love, we have maternal love, we have jealousy, grief, lying, desire, intelligence, shame, compassion, pain, fear, things like that. So there are chapters dedicated to each emotion or feeling or sort of human-like experience. And he tells anecdotes from his own sort of experience as a forester. And it's extremely interesting and extremely eye-opening. There is an anecdote about a lying rooster. There is an anecdote about pigs um, who know each other's names. And also there is um, a bit of scientific research about oxytocin found in goats, which is a hormone that is activated in humans when we fall in love. So here's some food for thought. So the next book is The Secret Library by Oliver Turrell. The subtitle is A Book Lover's Journey Through Curiosities of History. So this book is a nonfiction. It's divided into chapters which are devoted to major historical periods and going through the major events in history of the book. So for instance, let me read you from the inside. You learn about the forgotten Victorian novelist who outsold Dickens the woman who became the first published poet in America and the ex eccentric traveler who introduced the table fork to England. So, and it has a lot of great sort of lists. Um, you learn, you know, who was the first to write the detective novel or who was the first to write an erotic novel. And those are very, very much things that you wouldn't expect because it's not necessarily the thing that they teach you in lit classes. It's actually digging deeper and looking at authors who are majorly forgotten right now. And also, the cover is absolutely beautiful. And this is what it looks like underneath. So I do recommend it, but also I recommend the blog Interesting Literature. The next one is A Movable Piece by Ernest Hemingway. And this is Ernest Hemingway's memoir about the first years of his being a writer, his striving to build a career as a writer. This is right after the First World War in the 20s, and he is living in Paris along with, to name a few, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Gertrude Stein. Uh, if you've seen the Woody Allen movie Midnight in Paris, one of the characters is Hemingway, so that's sort of the time frame. I don't gel well with Hemingway. I always thought that, you know, he is not for me. But this memoir, 
was just amazing. It makes you want to go to Paris, write a novel in a cafe. But it's also very valuable for beginning novelists, Phoebe looking at you, because it talks a lot about struggles, about how it doesn't pay well, how you have to go hungry in order to feed your wife because you're not really making money off of your writing. Also how you deal with inspiration, how you deal with being a naive writer, thinking that you know things, that you have to share things, but then realizing that it was just young idealism. But it captures so well the atmosphere of the time. And especially if you don't like Hemingway's fiction, this might be for you, and especially for any young artists starting out, I definitely recommend this. Okay, this next book is a little bit weird in the sense that it is not one of my favorite books from 2017, but still, it somehow made the list. This is uh, The Light Between Oceans by M. L. Stedman. This is a movie tie-in cover, which I hate those. The Light Between Oceans is a book about Tom and Isabel who live on a small island. They are the only inhabitants of up the coast of Australia because Tom is the lighthouse keeper. They have been married for a short period of time and this one time they see a small boat which is off the shore of their little island and in the boat there is a dead man and a baby. At that point Isabel had had three miscarriages and the last one of her miscarriages was just very shortly before that point so if they were to keep the baby, it wouldn't really be suspicious. So it's about their choice, what to do. Do they report the fact that um, an unknown baby who might or might not have parents has been found or do they keep it? I love the story. I love the atmosphere. I love the idea. I connected well with the characters and the ethical questions that this book asks of its readers. However, I did not like the book. I didn't think the writing was superb, the pacing was off. However, the descriptions of the island were really sort of cinematic. And, you know, reading this book, I kept having this feeling that this story would really lend itself better to the cinematic format. But there is a movie, um, and the movie stars Alicia Vikander and Michael Fassbender whom I love, and the movie is really excellent. And you will not hear this often from me. The movie was so much better than the book. So basically, I'm showing you this book to tell you I love the movie, <laughs> which is a weird way around that, but um, really, I feel like that book was written specifically for the movie to be done. I feel like that was blasphemous. My next book is the Magician of Lublin by Isaac Bashevis Singer. This was published in 1960. Isaac Bashevis Singer was a writer who wrote actually in Yiddish. So this particular edition was translated from Yiddish to Polish, but you can actually get the Penguin Modern Classics, I think, has an edition of this. This book, I am recommending it to you because it was really shocking for me to find that Isaac Bashevis Singer was obviously a very acclaimed Jewish writer. However, people online sort of don't talk about him. This is centered about Yasha in the 1880s, I want to say. It's set in Warsaw. And Yasha is a magician. He is compared to Houdini of his time. And he has a dutiful wife. He has a, a female assistant. And he basically has a lover in every town that he travels to. So this book is about how all of those manifestations of love catch up with him and what he decides to do with it, what are the consequences of it. This book is amazing. Just the language was so simplistic but so fairy tale-esque, sort of. And it reads almost like a parable. Also, it was really appealing to me because it has pre-war, Warsaw, and a bit of Jewish culture. So, recommend it. So now we are moving into top five. Um, the Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. And it combines gothic lit, adventure, and a detective story. This is not a ghost story. A lot of people go into this thinking this is a ghost story. Nope. But this story is about Walter Hartwright, who is engaged as a drawing teacher and as he is going to the household where he will be working, he meets this woman all clad in white who is all alone walking to London in the middle of the night. And he accompanies her 
and because she's all alone, he's a gentleman, and he gets her into a carriage. But later he learns that possibly she escaped from a lunatic asylum. I hate that term. And I can't really tell you more because I would give away a lot. And this is my second Wookiee Collins, um, and it also employs, much as the Moonstone, many different perspectives in terms of different characters are narrating the story. I think this has five or six perspectives. It is extremely well paced. It was a Victorian bestseller. Wilkie Collins was a close friend of Charles Dickens and he mainly wrote middle brow adventure books for the masses and those are the books that I enjoy the most. This book is also pretty big and it's Outlander by Diana Gabaldon and so Outlander is this really epic um, series of 10 books. This is the first of them. I first got interested in Outlander because of the uh, TV show. So this book is about Claire Randall, who used to be a nurse during the Second World War, and it's now 1946. And along with her husband, Frank, she goes on her second honeymoon to the Scottish Highlands because they first had gotten married shortly before the war. And so, during an interesting turn of, of events, she goes through the magical stones, like a stone circle, kind of like Stonehenge, back in time, and she ends up in 1743. Da da da! Romance and chaos ensue. And really what is amazing about this book is that it is painstakingly researched in terms of, you know, historical detail. This really got me interested in the Scottish Rebellion, you know, Bonnie Prince Charlie, the Battle of Culloden in 1746. Um, so yes, this was sort of my gateway into Scottish history, which is not a bad thing. And I am looking forward to delving deeper into the series. Oh, also I need to tell you that this is really romance heavy, but in a good way. Okay, so now we are progressing to the creme de la creme. And this next book is Howard's End by Ian Forster. I am kind of afraid to review it because I know that I will not be able to do this book justice. Okay, so this book is about two sisters, Helen and Margaret Schlegel, and also their friendship with the family of Wilcoxes and Leonard Bast. All of those three families represent different classes. Margaret and Helen come from an aristocratic family, however, they are impoverished. The Wilcoxes are sort of parvenus, very rich, but also they don't have that family tradition. And Leonard Bast is very, very poor. However, he has that intellectual drive that really connects him to Margaret and Helen, who are very much also culturally aware and intellectually driven, whereas the Wilcoxes really view education and intellectual discussions as something boring and unnecessary in their station. So it's all about the dynamics within the classes, but this book was published in uh, 1910 and sort of the motto of the book is only connect. It's about finding connections in between the classes. Also sort of the anti-German sentiment is very much present here because the Schlegel sisters are descended of a German family. And although they are through and through English, they are facing some prejudice. So the only connect motto also applies here. So it's all about sort of the clashes between classes, how to find improbable connections in order to reach dialogue. And it's also about sisterly love. It's about intellectual curiosity. It's about appreciation of art and nature. In the words of Oliver Sally Brass, who expressed it much better, than I could. It is concerned with the relationships, the possibility of reconciliation between certain pairs of opposites, the pros and the passion, the seen and the unseen, the practical mind and the intellectual, the outer life and the inner. And all of those themes are sort of um, concentrated around the house called Howard's End. It's excellent. Please read it. Also, the movie is absolutely excellent. It stars Emma Thompson as Margaret, Helena Bonham Carter as Helen, and Anthony Hopkins as Mr. Wilcox. This is Wives and Daughters by Elizabeth Gaskell. You guys know that I absolutely adore Elizabeth Gaskell. And this one is my favorite. It is one of the best books ever written in the history of literature. And I do not say this lately. Wives and Daughters is about 17-year-old um, Molly Gibson, 
who lives with her father, Mr. Gibson, who is a doctor. She had lost her mom as a toddler and at some point, because she's 17, Mr. Gibson decides to get remarried for the sake of Molly so that she can have a motherly figure in her life. The book deals a lot with the sort of family rearrangement with Mrs. Gibson entering the family and also her daughter Cynthia who is around the age of Molly. It's also about Molly's um, friendship with a Hamley family who Squire Hamley and Mrs. Hamley are again sort of parental figures to Molly and their two sons Roger and Osborne. This book is about love, class, small town uh, in pre-Victorian society, sisterly love, grief, and the position of women, and it's excellent. Bear in mind that Elizabeth Gaskell died while writing this novel. She almost finished it, it's really clear what happens, and the BBC miniseries actually includes the ending that wasn't written, but that works so well, and everybody, you really know what happens, I guess, like, it would have taken five pages max um, to include, but sh sadly she died, like, right before completing those five pages. It's so superbly written. I love it. Please read it. My favorite book of 2017. Are you ready for this? Because this one is pretty hefty. Whoop. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. So fortunately, my edition has four volumes, which was very helpful because otherwise this book is 1,200 pages long. Um, it is pretty epic, to say the least. War and Peace is what I imagine childbirth to be like. Bear with me. During the course of the novel, you are so ready for it to be over. It's 1,200 pages. It's all about military strategy immense amount of detail about like the ranking system dur during the Napoleonic Wars and like all of the details of the Battle of Borodino and the Battle of Austerlitz and like who was where and like you're so ready for it to be over. You're like, how long do I have to endure this? But then once you finished it, you're like, this was the best book I've ever read. So I have absolutely zero interest in military strategy. However, War and Peace was an amazing book. It doesn't really have, in the true Tolstoy fashion, a main character. There are maybe five or six characters that you could consider main characters, and the book switches perspectives between them. Also, the book switches sections between the military sections and the character-based sections. So not all the characters are actively fighting the war. So among the most prominent and important characters, you have Pierre Bezukhov, who is the illegitimate son of a very important and rich count. You have Prince Andrei Bolkonsky and his sister Maria, who Andrei is a high-ranking military officer, and Natasha Rostova. Yeah, this video is way too long already, so it's really hard for me to go into detail because, well, guess what? Like, how do you get into detail? Even though this is set during the Napoleonic Wars, in the context of the Russian society, it has a lot of themes that are still relevant today. Aside from the themes of love, steadfastness in love, searching for the meaning of life, it also um, talks a lot about the philosophy of war. Why do we wage wars? How do we decide on a strategy? And what influences how wars are played out? I will be rereading it time and time again during my lifetime, I'm pretty sure of it. If you are not really ready to commit to War and Peace, I recommend there are two excellent movies, or I mean, one is a movie, it's um, from 1956 and it stars Audrey Hepburn and Mel Ferrer and also there's this uh, BBC miniseries from uh, 2016 which stars Lily James and is also really really excellent. Oh, uh, I've been talking for a long time. I hope you forgive me um, if you've gotten to this part of the video. Um, I congratulate you but I'll see you next week. Bye!